Chapter 11 Maelstrom Nobody really understands gold prices, and I don't pretend to understand them either. Ben Bernanke, former Federal Reserve Board Chairman, July 18, 2013 I think that, at this time, this global civilization has gone beyond its limits because it has created such a cult of money. Pope Francis, July 26, 2013 The Snowflake and the Avalanche An avalanche is an apt metaphor of financial collapse. Indeed, it is more than a metaphor, because the system's analysis of an avalanche is identical to the analysis of how one bank collapse cascades into another. An avalanche starts with a snowflake that perturbs other snowflakes which, as momentum builds, tumble out of control. The snowflake is like a single bank failure, followed by sequential panic, ending in fired financiers forced to vacate the premises of ruined Wall Street firms carrying their framed photos and coffee mugs. Both the avalanche and the bank panic are examples of complex systems undergoing what physicists call a phase transition, a rapid, unforeseen transformation from a steady state to disintegration, finally coming to rest in a new state, completely unlike the starting place. The dynamics are the same, as are the recursive mathematical functions used in modeling the processes. Importantly, the relationship between the frequency and severity of events as a function of systemic scale, called degree of distribution, is also the same. In assessing the risk of financial collapse, one should not only envision an avalanche, but study it as well. Complexity theory, first advanced in the early 1960s, is new as the history of science goes, but it offers striking insights on how complex systems behave. Many analysts use the words complex and complicated interchangeably, but that is inexact. A complicated mechanism, like the clockworks on St. Mark's Square in Venice, may have many moving parts, but it can be assembled and disassembled in straightforward ways. The parts do not adapt to one another, and the clock cannot suddenly turn into a sparrow and fly away. In contrast, complex systems sometimes do morph and fly away, or slide down mountains or ruin nations. Complex systems include moving parts, called autonomous agents, but they do more than move. The agents are diverse, connective, interactive, and adaptive. Their diversity and connectivity can be modeled to a limited extent, but interaction and adaptation quickly branch into a seeming infinity of outcomes that can be modeled in theory but not in practice. To put it another way, one can know that bad things might happen, yet never know exactly why. Clocks, watches, and motors are examples of constrained systems that are complicated but not complex. Contrast these with ubiquitous complex systems, including earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, and capital markets. A single human being is a complex system. One billion human beings engaged in trading stocks, bonds, and derivatives constitute an immensely complex system that defies comprehension, let alone computation. This computational challenge does not mean policymakers and risk managers should throw their hands up or use make-believe models like value at risk. Risk management is possible with the right combination of complexity tools and another essential, humility about what is knowable. Consider the avalanche. The climbers and skiers at risk can never know when an avalanche will start or which snowflake will cause it. But they do know that certain conditions are more dangerous than others and that precautions are possible. Snow's wetness or dryness is carefully observed, as is air temperature and wind speed. Most important, alpinists observe the snowpack size, or what physicists call 
systemic scale. Those in danger know that a large snowpack can unleash not just a large avalanche, but an exponentially larger one. Sensible adaptations include locating villages away from chutes, skiing outside the slide paths, and climbing ridgelines above the snow. Alpinists can also descale the snowpack system with dynamite. One cannot predict avalanches, but one can try to stay safe. In capital markets, regulators too often do not stay safe. Rather, they increase the danger. Permitting banks to build up derivatives books is like ignoring snow accumulation. Allowing J.P. Morgan Chase to grow larger is like building a village directly in the avalanche path. Using value at risk to measure market danger is like building a ski lift to the unsteady snowpack with free lift tickets for all. Current financial regulatory policy is misguided because the risk management models are unsound. More unsettling still is the fact that Wall Street executives know the models are unsound but use them anyway because the models permit higher leverage, bigger profits, and larger bonuses. The regulators suspect as much but play along, often in the hope of landing a job with the banks they regulate. Metaphorically speaking, the bankers' mansions are high on a ridgeline far from the village, while the villagers, everyday Americans and citizens around the world, are in the path of the avalanche. Financial avalanches are goaded by greed, but greed is not a complete explanation. Bankers' parasitic behavior, the result of a cultural phase transition, is entirely characteristic of a society nearing collapse. Wealth is no longer created, it is taken from others. Parasitic behavior is not confined to bankers. It also infects high government officials, corporate executives, and the elite societal stratum. The key to wealth preservation is to understand the complex processes and to seek shelter from the cascade. Investors are not helpless in the face of elite decadence. Risk, Uncertainty, and Criticality The prototypical explication of financial risk comes from Frank H. Knight's seminal 1921 work, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. Knight distinguished between risk, by which he meant an unknown outcome that can nevertheless be modeled with a degree of expectation or probability, and uncertainty, an unknown outcome that cannot be modeled at all. The poker game Texas Hold'em is an example of risk, as Knight used the term. When a card is about to be turned up, a player does not know in advance what it will be, but he does know, with certainty, that it will be one among 52 unique possibilities in one of four suits. As more cards are turned up, the certainty increases because some outcomes have been eliminated by prior play. The gambler takes risks, but is not dealing with complete uncertainty. Now, imagine the same game with a player who insists on using wild cards. In a wild card game, any card can be deemed to be any other card by any player to help her make a high hand like a full house or a straight flush. Technically, this is not complete Knightian uncertainty, but it comes close. Even the best poker players with superb computational skills cannot compute the odds of making a hand with wild cards. This is why professional poker players detest wild card games, and amateurs enjoy them. The wild card is also a good proxy for complexity. Turning the two of clubs into an ace of spades on a whim is like a phase transition, unpredictable, instantaneous, and potentially catastrophic if one is on the losing side of the bet. Knight's work came 40 years before complexity theory emerged, before the advent of the computer made possible advanced research into randomness and stochastic systems. His division of the financial landscape into the black and white worlds of risk and uncertainty was useful at the time, but today there are more shades of gray. Random numbers are those that cannot be predicted, but can be assigned values based on a probability of occurrence over time 
or in a long series. Coin tosses and playing cards are familiar examples. It's impossible to know if the next coin toss will be heads or tails, and you cannot know if the next card in the deck is the ace of spades, but you can compute the odds. Stochastic models are those that describe systems based on random number inputs. Such systems are not deterministic, but probabilistic, and when applied to financial markets, they allow prices and values to be assigned based on the probabilities. This was Knight's definition of risk. Stochastic systems may include nonlinear functions, or exponents, that cause small input changes to produce massive changes in results. Stochastic models are supplemented by integral calculus, which measures quantity, and differential calculus, which measures change. Regressions, which are backward-looking associations of one variable to another, allow researchers to correlate certain events. This taxonomy of random numbers, stochastic systems, nonlinear functions, calculus, and regression comprises Modern Finance's Toolkit. The application of this toolkit to derivatives pricing, value at risk, monetary policy, and economic forecasting takes practitioners to the cutting edge of economic theory. Beyond the cutting edge is complexity theory. Complexity has not been warmly embraced by mainstream economics, in part because it reveals that much economic research for the past half century is irrelevant or deeply flawed. Complexity is a quintessential example of new science overturning old scientific paradigms. Economists' failure to embrace the new science of complexity goes some way toward explaining why the market collapses in 1987, 1998, 2000, and 2008 were both unexpected and more severe than experts believed possible. Complexity offers a way to understand the dynamics of feedback loops through recursive functions. These have so many instantaneous iterations that explosive results may emerge from minute causes too small even to be observed. An example is the atomic bomb. Physicists know that when highly enriched uranium is engineered into a critical state and a neutron generator is applied, a catastrophic explosion will result that can level a city. But they do not know precisely which subatomic particle will start the chain reaction. Modern economists spend their time looking for the subatomic particle while ignoring the critical state of the system. They are looking for snowflakes and ignoring the avalanche. Another formal property of complex systems is that the size of the worst event can happen as an exponential function of the system scale. This means that when a complex system's size is doubled, the systemic risk does not double. It may increase by a factor of 10 or more. This is why each financial collapse comes as a surprise to bankers and regulators. As systemic scale is increased by derivatives, systemic risk grows exponentially. Criticality in a system means that it is on the knife edge of collapse. Not every complex system is in a critical state, as some may be stable or subcritical. One challenge for economists is that complex systems not in the critical state often behave like non-complex systems, and their stochastic properties can appear stable and predictable right up to the instant of criticality, at which point emergent properties manifest and a catastrophe unfolds too late to stop. Again, enriched uranium serves as an illustration. A 35-pound block of uranium shaped as a cube poses no risk. It is a complex system. The subatomic particles do interact, adapt, and decay, but no catastrophe is imminent. But when the uranium block is precision engineered in two parts, one the size of a grapefruit and one like a baseball bat, and the parts are forced together by high explosives, an atomic explosion results. The system goes from subcritical to critical by engineering. Complex systems can also go from subcritical to critical spontaneously. They morph in the same way a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, a process physicists call 
self-organized criticality. Social systems including capital markets are characterized by such self-organized criticality. One day, the stock market behaves well, and the next day, it unexpectedly collapses. The 22.6% one-day stock market crash on Black Monday, October 19, 1987, and the 7% 15-minute flash crash on May 6, 2010, are both examples of the financial system self-organizing into the critical state. At that point, it takes one snowflake, or one sell order, to start the collapse. Of course, it is possible to go back after the fact and find a particular sell order that, supposedly, started the market crash, an example of hunting for snowflakes. But the sell order is irrelevant. What matters is the system state. That central banks intervene in gold markets is neither new nor surprising. To the extent that gold is money and central banks control money, then central banks must control gold. Prior to gold's partial demonetization in the mid-1970s, central bank involvement in gold markets was arguably not manipulative but a matter of policy, although the policy was conducted non-transparently. In the post Bretton Woods era, there have been numerous well-documented central bank gold market manipulations. In 1975, Federal Reserve Chairman Arthur Burns wrote a secret memorandum to President Gerald Ford that stated, The broad question is whether central banks and governments should be free to buy gold at market-related prices. The Federal Reserve is opposed. Early removal of the present restraints on official purchases from the private market could well release forces and induce actions that would increase the relative importance of gold in the monetary system. Such freedom would provide an incentive for governments to revalue their official gold holdings at a market-related price. Liquidity creation of such extraordinary magnitude would seriously endanger, perhaps even frustrate our efforts, to get inflation under control. I have a secret understanding in writing with the Bundesbank that Germany will not buy gold either from the market or from another government, at a price above the official price of $42.22 per ounce. Just three days after the Burns Memorandum was written, President Ford sent a letter to German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt incorporating the substance of Burns's advice. From the White House, Washington, June 6, 1975. Dear Mr. Chancellor, we feel strongly that some safeguards are necessary to ensure that a tendency does not develop to place gold back in the center of the system. We must ensure that there is no opportunity for governments to begin active trading in gold among themselves with the purpose of creating a gold block or reinstating reliance on gold as the principal international monetary medium. In view of the worldwide inflation problem, we must also guard against any further large increase in international liquidity. If governments were entirely free to trade with one another at market-related prices, we would add to our own common inflation problem. Sincerely, Gerald R. Ford Central bank gold market manipulation wasn't unique in the 1970s, but continued in the decades that followed. A Freedom of Information Act, an FOIA, lawsuit against the Federal Reserve System filed by an advocacy group uncovered meeting notes of the Secret Gold and Foreign Exchange Committee of G-10 Central Bank Governors held at the Bank for International Settlements on April 7, 1997. That committee is the successor to the notorious 1960s London Gold Pool Price Fixing Scheme. The notes, prepared by Dino Kos of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, include the following. In May 1996, the market traded the equivalent of $3 billion of gold daily. Swap deals accounted for 75% of the volume. Gold had traditionally been a secretive market. Gold leasing was also a prominent piece of the market, whose growth central banks were very much a part of. The central banks, in turn, had been responding to pressures 
that they turn a non-earning asset into one that generates at least some positive return. Central banks mostly lent gold at maturities of three to six months. Central banks had some responsibility for the gold leasing market, since it was their activity which made that market possible to begin with. Gold does have a role as a war chest and in the international monetary system. BIS had not sold any gold in many years. The BIS did some leasing. Peter Fisher, United States, noted that the price of gold had historically not trended toward the cost of production. This seemed to suggest an ongoing supply-demand imbalance. He had the sense that the gold leasing market was an important component in this puzzle. Maynard, Germany, asked how a big sale would affect the market. What would happen, say, if the central bank sold 2,500 tons, equivalent to one year's production? Nobody took up Maynard's challenge. Peter Fisher explained that U.S. gold belongs to the Treasury. However, the Treasury had issued gold certificates to the reserve banks, and so gold also appears on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. If there were to be a reevaluation of gold, the certificates would also be revalued upwards. However, to prevent the Fed's balance sheet from expanding, this would lead to sales of government securities. More recently, on September 17, 2009, former Federal Reserve Board Governor Kevin Warsh sent a letter to a Virginia law firm denying an FOIA request for documentation of Fed gold swaps on the grounds that the Fed had an exemption for information relating to swap arrangements with foreign banks on behalf of the Federal Reserve System. While the FOIA request was denied, Warsh's letter at least acknowledged that central bank swaps exist. On May 31, 2013, Isuke Sakakibara, former vice minister of the Japanese Ministry of Finance, cheerfully recalled how Japan's government had secretly acquired 300 tons of gold in the mid-1980s. This gold acquisition does not appear in the Bank of Japan's reserve position reported by the World Gold Council because it was executed by the finance ministry rather than by the central bank. He states, We bought 300 tons of gold in the 1980s to strike a commemorative coin for the 60th anniversary of the reign of Emperor Hirohito. It was a very difficult operation. We worked through J.P. Morgan and Citibank. We could not disclose our actions because it was a very large quantity, and we did not want the price to go up that much. So we bought gold futures, which are very liquid, and then we surprised the market by standing for delivery. Some of the bars delivered were three nines, that is, 99.90% pure, but we melted them down and refined them into four nines. 99.99% pure, because we could only use the finest gold for the emperor. The gold was transported to Japan by Brinks in the upper deck of two Boeing 747s configured for cargo use. Two shipments were used not because of weight, but to spread the risk. Brinks had two couriers on each flight so that the gold could be watched at all times, even as one courier slept. The foregoing documentation record is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of official gold market manipulation by central banks, finance ministries, and their respective bank agents. Still, it establishes beyond dispute that governments use a combination of gold purchases, sales, leases, swaps, futures, and political pressure to manipulate gold prices in order to achieve policy objectives. They have done so for decades since the end of Bretton Woods. Official gold sales that depressed gold prices were practiced extensively by Western Central Banks from 1975 to 2009, but came to an abrupt end in 2010, as gold prices skyrocketed and citizens questioned the wisdom of selling such a valuable asset. The most notorious and heavily criticized case involved the sale of 395 tons of UK gold by Chancellor of the Exchequer Gordon Brown in a series of auctions from July 1999 to March 2002. The average price received by the UK was about $275 per ounce. Using $1,500 per ounce as a reference price, losses to the UK citizens from Brown's blunder exceeded $17 billion.
More damaging than the lost wealth was the UK's diminished standing among the ranks of global gold powers. Recently, outright gold sales by central banks as a form of price manipulation have lost their appeal as gold reserves have been depleted, prices have surged, and the United States has conspicuously refused to sell any gold of its own. The more powerful price manipulation techniques by central banks and their private bank agents involve swaps, forwards, and futures, or leases. These paper gold transactions permit massive leverage and exert downward pressure on gold prices, while the physical gold seldom leaves the central bank vaults. A gold swap is typically conducted between two central banks as an exchange of gold for currency, with a promise to reverse the transaction in the future. In the meantime, the party receiving the currency can invest it for a return over the life of the swap. Gold forward and gold futures transactions are conducted either between private banks and counterparties or on exchanges. These are contracts that promise gold delivery at a future date. The difference between a forward and a future is that the forward is traded over the counter with a known counterparty, while a future is traded anonymously on an exchange. Parties earn a profit or incur a loss depending on whether the gold price rises or falls between the contract date and the future delivery date. In a lease arrangement, one central bank leases its gold to a private bank that sells it on a forward basis. The central bank collects a fee for the lease, like rent. When a central bank leases gold, it gives the private banks the title needed to conduct forward sales. The forward sales market is then amplified by the practice of selling unallocated gold. When a bank sells unallocated gold to a customer, the customer does not own specific gold bars. This allows the bank to sell multiple contracts to multiple parties using the same gold. In allocated transactions, the client has direct title to specific numbered bars in the vault. These arrangements have one thing in common, which is that physical gold is rarely moved, and the same gold can be pledged many times to support multiple contracts. If the Federal Reserve Bank of New York leases 100 tons to J.P. Morgan in London, J.P. Morgan then takes legal possession under the lease, but the gold remains in the Fed's New York vault. With legal title in hand, J.P. Morgan can then sell the same gold 10 times to different customers on an unallocated basis. Similarly, a bank like HSBC can enter the futures market and sell 100 tons of gold to a buyer for delivery in three months, but needs no physical gold to do so. The seller needs only to meet margin requirements in cash, which are a small fraction of the gold's value. These leveraged paper gold transactions are far more effective in manipulating market prices than outright sales, because the gold does not have to leave the central bank vaults. Therefore, the amount of selling power is many times greater than the gold on hand. The easiest way for central banks to disguise their actions in the gold markets is to use bank intermediaries such as J.P. Morgan. The granddaddy of all bank intermediaries is the Bank for International Settlements, based in Basel, Switzerland. That the BIS acts for the central bank clients in the gold markets is not surprising. In fact, it was one reason the BIS was created in 1930. The BIS denominates its financial books and records in SDRs, as does the IMF. The BIS website states plainly, Around 90% of customer placements are denominated in currencies, with the remainder in gold. Gold deposits amount to SDR $17.6 billion. That's about $27 billion. At March 31, 2013, the bank owned 115 tons of fine gold at March 31, 2013. The BIS's 83rd Annual Report for the period ending March 31, 2013, states, The bank transacts gold on behalf of its customers, thereby providing access to a large liquidity base in the context of, for example, regular rebalancing of reserve portfolios or major changes in reserve currency allocations, 
In addition, the bank provides gold services such as buying and selling, site accounts, fixed-term deposits, earmarked accounts, upgrading and refining, and location exchanges. Site accounts in gold are unallocated, and earmarked accounts in gold are allocated. In finance, site is an old legal term meaning payable on demand or presentment, although there is no requirement to have the gold on hand until such demand is actually made. The BIS achieves the same leverage employed by its private bank peers using leasing, forwards, and futures. Notably, footnote 15 of the accounting policies in the 2010 BIS annual report stated, Gold loans comprise fixed-term gold loans to commercial banks. In the 2013 report, the same footnote stated, Gold loans comprise fixed-term gold loans. Apparently, by 2013, the BIS considered it wise to hide the fact that the BIS deals with private commercial banks. This deletion makes sense because the BIS is one of the main transmission channels for gold market manipulation. Central banks deposit gold with the BIS, which then leases the gold to commercial banks. Those commercial banks sell the gold on an unallocated basis which allows $10 of sale or more for every $1 of gold deposited at the BIS. Massive, downward pressure is exerted on the gold market, but no physical gold ever changes hands. It is a well-honed system for gold price suppression. While the presence of central banks in gold markets is undoubted, the exact times and places of their manipulation are not disclosed. But intriguing inferences can be made. For example, on September 18, 2009, the IMF authorized the sale of 403.3 tons of gold. Of that amount, 212 tons were sold during October and November 2009 to the central banks of India, Mauritius, and Sri Lanka. In addition, 10 tons were sold to the Central Bank of Bangladesh in September 2010. These sales were done by prearrangement to avoid disrupting the market. Sales of the remaining 181.3 tons commenced on February 17, 2010, but the buyers have never been disclosed. The IMF claimed the other sales were on-market, but also said that initiation of on-market sales do not preclude further off-market gold sales directly to interested central banks or other official holders. In other words, the 181.3 tons could easily have gone to China or the BIS. At the same time as the IMF gold sales were announced and conducted, the BIS reported a sharp spike in its own gold holdings. BIS gold increased from 154 tons at the end of 2009 to over 500 tons at the end of 2010. It is possible that the IMF transferred part of the unaccounted for 181.3 tons to the BIS, and that the BIS Banking Department, controlled at the time by Gunter Plinus, a former central banker from Germany, sold the gold to China. It is also possible that the large gold influx was attributable to gold swaps from desperate European banks trying to raise cash to meet obligations as their asset values imploded during the sovereign debt crisis. The answer is undisclosed. But either way, the BIS stood ready to facilitate such non-transparent gold market activity as it had done for the Nazis and others since 1930. Some of the most compelling evidence for manipulation in gold markets comes from a study conducted by the research department of one of the largest global macro hedge funds in the world. This study involved two hypothetical investment programs over a 10-year period from 2003 to 2013. One program would buy gold futures at the New York Comex opening price every day and sell at the close. The other program would buy gold at the beginning of after-hours trading and sell just before the Comex opened the following day. In effect, one program would own New York hours and the other program would own the after-hours. In a non-manipulated market, these two programs 
should produce nearly identical results over time, albeit with daily variations. In fact, the New York program revealed catastrophic losses, while the After Hours program showed spectacular gains well in excess of the market gold price over the same period. The inescapable inference is that manipulators slam the New York close, which creates excess profit opportunities for the after-hours traders. Since the New York close is the most widely reported price of gold, the motivation is equally clear. The motivation for central bank gold market manipulation is as subtle as the methods used. Central banks want inflation to reduce the real value of government debt and to transfer wealth from savers to banks. But central banks also work to suppress the price of gold. These twin goals seem difficult to reconcile. If central banks want inflation, and if a rising gold price is inflationary, why would central banks suppress the gold price? The answer is that central banks, principally the Federal Reserve, do want inflation, but they want it to be orderly rather than disorderly. They want the inflation to come in small doses, so it goes unnoticed. Gold is highly volatile, and when it spikes up sharply, it raises inflationary expectations. The Federal Reserve and the BIS suppress gold prices not to keep them down forever, but rather to keep the increases orderly so that savers do not notice inflation. Central banks act like a nine-year-old boy who sees $50 in his mom's wallet and steals $1, thinking she won't notice. The boy knows that if he takes 20 mom will notice and he will be punished. Inflation of 3% per year is barely noticed, but if it persists for 20 years, it cuts the value of the national debt almost in half. This kind of slow, steady inflation is the central bank's goal. Managing inflation expectations by manipulating gold prices downward was the rationale given by Fed Chairman Arthur Burns to President Gerald Ford in the secret 1975 memo. That hasn't changed. Since then, however, an even more ominous motive for central bank gold price manipulation has emerged. The gold price must be kept low until gold holdings are rebalanced among the major economic powers, and the rebalancing must be completed before the collapse of the international monetary system. When the world returns to a gold standard, either by choice to create inflation or of necessity to restore confidence, it will be crucial to have support from all the world's major economic centers. A major economy that does not have sufficient gold will either be relegated to the periphery of any new Bretton Woods-style conference or refuse to participate because it cannot benefit from gold's revaluation. As in a poker game, the United States possessed all the chips at Bretton Woods and used them aggressively to dictate the outcome. Were Bretton Woods to happen again, nations such as Russia and China would not permit the United States to impose its will. They would prefer to go their own way rather than be subordinate to U.S. financial hegemony. A more equal starting place would be required to engender cooperative process for reforming the system. Is there a preferred metric for rebalancing reserves? Many analysts look at the statistics for gold as a percentage of reserves. The United States has 73.3% of its reserves in gold. The comparable figure for China is 1.3%. But this metric is misleading. Most countries have reserves consisting of a combination of gold and hard currencies. But since the United States can print dollars, it has no need for large foreign currency reserves. And as a result, the U.S. reserve position is dominated by gold. China, on the other hand, has little gold, but approximately $3 trillion of hard currency reserves. Those reserves are valuable in the short run, even if they are vulnerable to inflation in the future. For these reasons, the 73% U.S. ratio overstates U.S. strength and the 1.3% ratio overstates China's weakness. A better measure of gold's role as a monetary reserve is to divide gold's nominal market value by nominal GDP. That would be a gold-to-GDP ratio. 
Nominal GDP is the total value of goods and services that an economy produces. Gold is the true monetary base, the implicit reserve asset behind the Fed's base money called M0. Gold is M sub zero. The gold to GDP ratio reveals the true money available to support the economy and presages the relative power of a nation if a gold standard resumes. Here are recent data for a select group of economies that together comprise over 75% of global GDP. Gold to GDP ratio for selected economies. I'll first give you the country, then the amount of gold in metric tons, then the market value of that gold at $1,500 per ounce, then the GDP, and then the gold to GDP ratio. The Eurozone, 10,783.4 tons. Market value, $569 billion. GDP, $12.3 trillion. Gold to GDP ratio, 4.6%. The United States, 8,133.5 tons. $429 billion. $15.7 trillion GDP. And finally, for the ratio, 2.7%. For China, 1,054.1 tons. Market value, $56 billion. GDP, $8.2 trillion. Ratio, 0.7%. Russia, 996.1 tons. Market value, $53 billion. GDP, $2 trillion. Ratio, 2.7%. Japan, 765.2 tons. $40 billion market value. A GDP of $6 trillion and a ratio of 0.7. India, 557.7 tons, with a market value of $29 billion. A GDP, $1.9 trillion and a ratio of 1.6%. The UK, 310.3 tons, with a value of $16 billion a GDP of $2.4 trillion and a percentage of 0.7%. Australia, 79.9 tons, of the market value of $4 billion, a GDP of $1.5 trillion and a ratio of 0.3%. Brazil, 67.2 tons, with a market value of $3.5 billion, GDP, $2.4 trillion, ratio, 0.1%. And finally, Canada, with 3.2 tons of gold, with a market value of $0.2 billion, a GDP of $1.8 trillion, and a ratio of 0.01%. For a grand total of 22,750.6 tons, with a market value of $1,199.7 billion, the GDP of $54.1 trillion, with a gold-to-GDP ratio of 2.2%. The global gold-to-GDP ratio of 2.2% reveals that the global economy is leveraged to real money at a 45-to-1 ratio, but with a significant skew in favor of the United States, the Eurozone, and Russia. Those three economies have ratios above the global average. The United States and Russia are in strategic gold parity, the result of Russia's 65% increase in its gold reserves since 2009. This dynamic is an eerie echo of the early 1960s missile gap, from a time when Russia and the United States competed for supremacy in nuclear weapons. That competition was deemed unstable and resulted in strategic arms limitations agreements in the 1970s which have maintained nuclear stability in the 40 years since. Russia has now closed the gold gap and stands on a par with the United States. The conspicuous weak links are China, the UK, and Japan, each with a 0.7% ratio. 
less than one-third the U.S.-Russia ratio, and far smaller than that of the Eurozone. Other major economies, such as Brazil and Australia, stand even lower, while Canada's gold hoard is trivial compared to the size of its economy. If gold is not money, these ratios are unimportant. If, however, there were a collapse of confidence in fiat money and a return to gold-backed money, either by design or on an emergency basis, these ratios would determine who would have the most influence in IMF or G20 negotiations to reform the international monetary system. On current form, Russia, Germany, and the United States would dominate those discussions. China's Gold Deception Once again, we find ourselves looking at China. It seems absurd to posit that the international monetary system could be reformed without major participation by China, the world's second-largest economy, third if the Eurozone is viewed as a single entity. It is known, but not publicly disclosed, that China has far greater gold reserves than it states officially. If the list of countries I just gave you were restated to show China with an estimated but more accurate 4,200 tons of gold, then the change in ratios is dynamic. In this revised alignment, the global ratio increases slightly from 2.2% to 2.5%, putting global gold leverage at 40 to 1. More important, China would now join the gold club with a 2.2% ratio, equivalent to Russia and the United States, and comfortably above the global average. Although it is rarely discussed publicly by monetary elites, the increase of China's gold ratio from 0.7% toward 2.7% when we readjust the numbers, has actually been occurring in recent years. When this gold rebalancing is complete, the international monetary system could move to a new equilibrium gold price without China being left behind with only paper money. The increase in China's gold reserves is designed to give China gold parity with Russia, the United States, and the Eurozone, and to rebalance global gold reserves. This rebalancing paves the way for either global inflation or gold's emergency use as a reserve currency. But the path has been complicated for China. When Europe and Japan emerged from the ashes of the Second World War, they were able to acquire gold by redeeming their dollar trade surpluses, since the dollar was freely convertible at a fixed price. U.S. gold reserves declined by 11,000 tons from 1950 to 1970, as Europe and Japan redeemed dollars for gold. Thirty years later, China was the dominant trading nation, earning large dollar surpluses. But the gold window had been closed since 1971, and China could not swap dollars for U.S. gold at a fixed price. As a result, China was forced to acquire its gold reserves on the open market and through its domestic mines. This market-based gold acquisition posed three dangers for China and the world. The first is that the market impact of such huge purchases meant that gold's price might skyrocket before China could complete the rebalancing. The second was that China's economy was growing so quickly that the amount of gold needed to reach strategic parity was a moving target. The third was that China could not dump its dollar reserves to buy gold because it would burden the United States with higher interest rates, which would hurt China's economy if U.S. consumers stopped buying Chinese goods in response. The greatest risk to China in the near future is that inflation will emerge in the United States before China obtains all the gold it needs. In that case, the combination of China's faster growth and higher gold prices will make it costly to maintain a gold-to-GDP ratio. However, once China does acquire sufficient bullion, it will have a hedged position because whatever is lost to inflation will be gained in higher gold prices. At that point, China can give a green light to U.S. inflation. This move toward evenly distributed gold reserves also explains central bank efforts at price manipulation, as the United States and China have a shared interest in keeping the gold price low until China acquires its gold. The solution is for the United States and China to coordinate gold price suppression through swaps, leases, and futures. Once the rebalancing is complete, probably in 2015, 
they will be less reason to suppress gold's price because China will not be disadvantaged in the event of a price spike. Evidence that the United States is accommodating China's gold reserve acquisition is not difficult to find. The most intriguing comment comes from Min Zhu, the IMF's deputy managing director. In response to a recent question concerning China's gold acquisition, he replied, China's acquisition of gold makes sense because most global reserves have some credit element to them. They're paper money. It's a good idea to have part of your reserves in something real. The use of the term credit to describe reserves is consistent with the reality that all paper money is a central bank liability and therefore a form of debt. Treasury bonds purchased with paper are likewise a form of debt. Minju's distinction between credit reserves and real reserves highlights precisely the role of gold as a true base money, or M sub zero. The reaction within the U.S. national security community to China's gold rebalancing is nonchalance. When asked about Chinese gold acquisitions, one of the highest ranking U.S. intelligence officials shrugged and said, Somebody's got to own it, as if gold reserves were part of a global garage sale. A senior official in the office of the Secretary of Defense expressed concern about the strategic implications of China's gold rebalancing, but then went on to say, the Treasury really doesn't like it when we talk about the dollar. The Pentagon and CIA routinely defer to the Fed and the U.S. Treasury when the subject turns to gold and dollars, while Congress is mostly in the dark on this subject. Congressman James Himes, one of only four members of either party, with a seat on both the House Financial Services Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, said, I never hear any discussion of gold reserve acquisition. With the military, intelligence agencies, and Congress all unconcerned or uninformed about China's acquisition of gold, the Treasury and Fed have a free hand to help the Chinese until the rebalancing is a fait accompli. Despite the discreet and delicate handling of the global gold rebalancing, there are increasing signs that the international monetary system may collapse before a transition to gold or SDRs is complete. In the argo of chaos theorists, the system is going wobbly. Almost every paper gold contract has the capacity to be turned into a physical delivery through a notice and conversion provision. The vast majority of all futures contracts are rolled over into more distant settlement periods or are closed out through an offset contract. But buyers of gold futures contracts have the right to request physical delivery of metal by providing notice and arranging to take delivery from designated warehouses. A gold lease can be terminated by the leaser at the end of its term. So-called unallocated gold can be turned into allocated bars, typically by paying additional fees, and the allocated gold can then be delivered to the owner on demand. Certain large gold exchange-traded fund, ETF, holders can convert to physical gold by redeeming the shares and taking gold from the ETF warehouse. The potentially destabilizing factor is that the amount of gold subject to paper contracts is 100 times the amount of physical gold backing those contracts. As long as holders remain in paper contracts, the system is in equilibrium. If holders in large numbers were to demand physical delivery, they could be snowflakes on an unstable mountain of paper gold. When other holders realize that the physical gold will run out before they can redeem their contracts for bullion, the slide can cascade into an avalanche, a de facto bank run, except the banks in this case are the gold warehouses that support the exchanges and ETFs. This is what happened in 1969 as European trading partners of the United States began cashing in dollars for physical gold. President Nixon shut the window on these redemptions in August 1971. If he had not done so, the U.S. gold vaults at Fort Knox would have been stripped bare by the late 1970s. A similar dynamic commenced on October 4, 2012, when spot gold prices hit an interim peak of $1,790 per ounce. From there, gold fell over 12% in the next six months. Then, 
gold crashed an additional 23.5 percent, falling to $1,200 per ounce by late June. Far from scaring off buyers, the gold crash made gold look cheap to millions of individual buyers around the world. They lined up at banks and boutiques, quickly stripping supplies. Buyers of standard 400-ounce and 1-kilo bars found there were no sellers. They had to wait almost 30 days for new bars to be produced by the refineries. The Swiss refineries Argo Horaeus and Pump moved to around-the-clock shifts to keep up with gold demand. Massive redemptions took place in gold ETFs, not because all investors were bearish on gold, but because some wanted to obtain bullion from the ETF warehouses. COMEX warehouses holding gold for futures contract settlements saw inventories draw down to levels last seen in the Panic of 2008. Gold futures contracts went into backwardation, a highly unusual condition in which gold for spot delivery is more expensive than gold for forward delivery. The opposite usually prevails because the forward seller has to pay for storage and insurance. This was another sign of acute physical shortages and high demand for immediate access to physical gold. If a gold-buying panic were to break out today, there is no single gold window for the president to close. Instead, a multitude of contractual clauses, in fine print rarely studied by gold buyers, would be called into play. Gold futures exchanges have the ability to convert contracts to cash liquidation only and to shut off the physical delivery channels. Gold bullion banks can also settle gold forward contracts for cash and deny buyers the ability to convert to allocated gold. The early termination and force majeure clauses buried in contracts could be used by banks that sold more gold than they had on hand. The result would be that investors would receive a cash settlement up to the contract termination date, but not more. Investors would get some cash, but no bullion, and would miss the price surge sure to follow. While physical gold was in short supply and high demand by early 2014, this did not necessarily mean that a super spike in gold prices was imminent. Not every snowslide turns into an avalanche. At times, the avalanche awaits different initial conditions. Central banks still have enormous resources, including potential physical sales, with which to suppress gold prices in the short run. Still, an alarm has gone off. The central bank's ability to keep a lid on gold prices has been challenged, and a new willingness of paper gold buyers to demand physical gold has emerged. As China's gold-buying operations continue apace, the entire international monetary system is tottering on the knife edge of China's aspirations and the global demand for physical gold. While the gold price oscillates between the forces of physical demand and central bank manipulation, another greater catastrophe is looming. The Federal Reserve Bank is on the brink of insolvency, if not already over the brink. This conclusion comes not from a Fed critic, but from Frederick S. Mishkin, one of the most eminent monetary economists in the world and mentor to Ben Bernanke and other Fed governors and economists. In his February 2013 paper, Crunch Time, Fiscal Crises and the Role of Monetary Policy, written with several colleagues, Mishkin warns that the Fed is dangerously close to the point where its independence is fatally compromised and its sole remaining purpose is to monetize deficit spending by causing inflation. Mishkin and his co-authors make better use of complexity theory and recursive functions in their analysis than any of their peers. They point out the feedback loop in sovereign finance among larger deficits, followed by higher borrowing costs, which cause even larger deficits and still higher borrowing costs and so on, until a death spiral begins. At that point, countries are faced with the unpalatable choice of either reducing deficits through so-called austerity measures or defaulting on the debts. Mishkin argues that austerity can hurt nominal growth, worsening the debt-to-GDP ratio and possibly causing a debt default in the course of trying to stop one. The alternative, in Mishkin's view, is for a central bank to keep interest rates under control by engaging in monetary ease, while politicians enact long-term deficit solutions. In the meantime, 
short-term deficits can be tolerated to avoid the austerity curse. Short-term monetary and fiscal ease work in tandem to keep an economy growing, while long-term fiscal reform reverses the death spiral. Mishkin says this approach works fine in theory, but he brings us back to the real world of dysfunctional political systems that have come to rely on monetary ease to avoid hard choices on the fiscal side. Mishkin calls this condition fiscal dominance. His paper describes the resulting crisis. In the extreme, unsustainable fiscal policy means that the government's intertemporal budget constraint will have to be satisfied by issuing monetary liabilities, which is known as fiscal dominance, or, alternatively, by a default on the government debt. Fiscal dominance forces the central bank to pursue inflationary monetary policy even if it has a strong commitment to control inflation, say with an inflation target. Fiscal dominance at some point in the future forces the central bank to monetize the debt, so that despite tight monetary policy in the present, inflation will increase. Ultimately, the central bank is without power to avoid the consequences of an unsustainable fiscal policy. If the central bank is paying for its open market purchases of long-term government debt with newly created reserves, then ultimately all the open market purchase does is exchange long-term government debt in the form of the initial treasury debt, for overnight government debt, in the form of interest-bearing reserves. It is well understood that any swap of long-term for short-term debt, in fact, makes the government more vulnerable to a self-fulfilling flight from government debt, or in the case of the U.S., to a self-fulfilling flight from the dollar. Fiscal dominance puts a central bank between a rock and a hard place. If the central bank does not monetize the debt, then interest rates on the government debt will rise sharply. Hence, the central bank will, in effect, have little choice and will be forced to purchase the government debt and monetize it, eventually leading to a surge in inflation. Mishkin and his co-authors point to another collapse in the making, independent of debt monetization and inflation. As the Fed buys longer-term debt with newly printed money, its balance sheet incurs large mark-to-market losses as interest rates rise. The Fed does not disclose these losses until it actually sells the bonds as part of an exit strategy, although independent analysts can estimate the size of the losses from information that is publicly available. Monetization of debt leaves the Fed with a Hobson's choice. If the United States tips into deflation, the debt-to-GDP ratio will worsen because there is insufficient nominal growth. If the United States tips into inflation, the debt-to-GDP ratio will worsen due to higher interest rates on U.S. debt. If the Fed fights inflation by selling assets, it will recognize losses on the bond sales, and its insolvency will become apparent. This insolvency can erode confidence and cause higher interest rates on its own. Fed bond losses will also worsen the debt-to-GDP ratio since the Fed can no longer remit profits to the Treasury, which increases the deficit. There appears to be no way out of a sovereign debt crisis for the United States. The paths are all blocked. The Fed avoided a measure of pain in 2009 with its monetary exertions and market manipulations. But the pain was stored up for another day. That day is here. Global monetary elites and the Fed, the IMF, and the BIS are playing for time. They need time for the U.S. to achieve long-term fiscal reform. They need time to create the global SDR market. They need time to facilitate China's acquisition of gold. The problem is that no time remains. A run on gold has begun before China has what it needs. The collapse of confidence in the dollar has begun before the SDR is ready to take its place. The Fed's insolvency is looming. As the dollar's 9-11 moment approaches, the system is blinking red.